Test, test. Eight. Test, test. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Four Balls Podcast, Halloween edition. <laughs> we got some golf balls for you guys, because you'll lose them all. Trophy ones. Welcome back. Uh, a couple of things uh, that popped in my mind when we were talking about what could we, what could we discuss? What stories could we discuss? Because I'm thinking, uh, I'm thinking uh, any sort of uh, drug or a locker room related activities. Got some um, of those. those are good. Uh, I'm thinking uh, cheapskates, maybe losing money or losing their shirt potentially sure, out on the golf course. Uh, those can be scary as well. Uh, you know, a little nervous uh, standing over that uh, $12,000 putt for, you know. It's nightmare fuel. Yeah, for a Scotch game. Yeah, <laughs> that would give me uh, the heebie jeebies Anyway, so I thought I'd start off with uh, something that scared the, uh, the crap out of me. Uh, I was a young assistant at a club just out of college. And, uh, you know, I'd, I'd worked at a golf course kind of growing up, but, you know, pretty protected, right? And I'm in the bag room and you know, doing carts and stuff like that. Sure, sure. And, you know, once you become an assistant professional, you're, you're wrapped into the, you know, the real meat and potatoes of running a member guest, right? You're printing off scorecards. You're, you're there at 4.30 in the morning. You're there till 10 o'clock at night, you know, drinking wine or whatever, or, you know, just trying to get through your day, to be honest, with a smile on your face, right? Sure. And not screw up. So I remember going through, uh, you know, we were paying out daily cash, for uh, for some of the participants in in the member guest and it's a four day member guest, which is absolutely That's ridiculously too long. Guess. One practice round, and then God, what was it eight matches, eight round robin matches going through, right? Uh, just brutal, just just a, a you know a marathon. And so I'm walking through the locker room. It's got to be 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night on the first, uh, after the first round, or the first two rounds, putting in, you know, proxies and some bets and stuff, and cash stuff in envelopes, putting them in the lockers. And, uh, you know, just walk right by, and uh, lo and behold, I uh, saw a couple of guys uh, with some powdery substance on the, mm-hmm. on the benches. <laughs> I will say, you know, uh, I, I, it's not my, not my cup of tea, so I, I declined the offer. Uh, that came my way shortly after, uh, and quickly handed one of them his envelope for 150 bucks for that day's skin. So uh, that kind of spooked me a little bit the first time sure. I, you know, kind of ran into that. They looked like they were having a blast and ready to go out for another 18. So <laughs> or 36. Or 36. Or 36. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's for sure. So that was uh, that was one that kind of you know gave me a good introduction to the life of a golf yeah. You pro. know, especially at private clubs, it's kind of a place where people go. Yeah, sometimes just to kind of hide their habits um, from whoever it might be. And you see some stuff. You see some stuff uh, that you're not uh, really supposed to talk about. But that's why we're talking about them today, because these people are all anonymous. Names and faces and club uh, identities are, you know. By the way, it happens at every club. Yep, there are no exceptions. It doesn't matter. The stuffy ones to the blue-collar ones, everybody's got some stuff going on. That's exactly right. What what you got? What you got? A couple of a uh, couple of events that have scared you in your kind of a recurring thing is a golf pro. I'm sure you had this a million times. Um, it would keep me up at night, quite frankly. When a guy would come in, so when you say, "Hey, how's it going?" Oh, I'm good. How are you? And then that's the end of the conversation. That should be the end of the conversation. That's it's fine with me. You don't want to get into like you know this and that. Okay, I'm just trying to be polite. So when somebody would come in and say, I would say, "How was it out there?" Oh, it was good. Beautiful day. Whatever. Or like, oh, I played really well. Or I didn't do so well. Whatever. Just a short talk. Thanks, Bob. Have a great day. How about when Bob decides to tell you about how he hit his approach just long on the second hole? And you're thinking, oh, my God, he's going to do it, isn't he? The and whole thing. And then he goes into his tee shot on three. The whole round. And then his approach on three oh. and so on and so forth. Is there anything worse than that? And this I should... love a good golf story. I love a good golf story. But going into depth about how you, like, hit a green with a five iron and two putted is not a worthwhile golf story. Like, I've seen that a thousand times. There's nothing interesting about that. So for all the bobs of the world out there, can you please just stop? Like, we, we don't want to hear it. It's not because I, I don't like you. It's just I've got better things to do than listen to a 10 handicap go through shot by shot how he shot his 85 because he's going to do the same thing again on Thursday. And that's fine. I'm glad he's playing, but come on. It's a little much. That's a lot much. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There should be a like pace of play monitor for golf stories. Right? Absolutely. For, for the round recap, you can do that upstairs in the locker room with your buddies. 
Your scorecard and your pencil and your little martini on the table. That's of course, fine. I, I don't care. Even when you're telling friends your friends' golf stories, are you talking to them about how you made a stretch of pars? Or like, oh, I hit it close and made the putt for birdie. No, I'm telling them about how I duck hooked it out of bounds or like, I don't know, shanked one into a tree and it kicked behind me. Like something that's a little bit more unusual than just like a typical. This should just be like a PSA, right? For, for those of you listening, I'm sure you've told some golf stories with your buddies probably from that same golf group. And that's, that's fine because this is one of those instances where you kind of have to be there, right? Yeah. You right. don't want to hear a story about someone's round when you weren't out there as a part of their round. I, know. I couldn't life. care less couldn't. what club you pulled on the 6T. It doesn't matter to me. Oh, did you hit into the weeds? Does, doesn't matter. Just skip right to 18. Give me right to 18, what'd you do on 18, and then let's just be on our way for the day, right? Well, and most of the time, even on 18, I don't really care, to be honest. <laughs> That's a good point. So um, I do recall a few years ago, um, the club I was working at, we had, uh, we had a, a very, very wealthy individual. Very wealthy. Only a couple of thousand of these people in the world. Uh, he was playing golf, right? And uh, finished up his round. He's an older gentleman, uh, as they so likely are at that stage. Older guy goes to pulls up to the bag drop, gets his clubs cleaned. Kids are scrubbing the, the wrenches on the back, and, and he goes to pull out some cash out of his wallet to tip, tip the guy, yeah, maybe sure. a dollar or two, right? Which is fine; that's his prerogative. And uh, out of this incredibly wealthy uh, wealthy man's wallet, uh, it was a fairly windy day, uh, blew uh, a five dollar bill. Oh God! And I've never seen an eighty year old move faster in my life. <laughs> Uh, trying to chase it down and, you know, stomp it, catch it, and uh, went right out into the parking lot uh, chasing that $5 bill. Got it, by the way. Uh, put it back bucks. in his wallet when he walked back and gave the kid two bucks. Nice. So Think about how much money he made in the time it took him to track down that $5. Well, that's what, that's what we were all <laughs> laughing about after the fact. Huh? How wealthy is he? Well, he's one of a couple thousand people uh, in, in the world. So, so, fairly wealthy. So, yeah, I would imagine, I would imagine that... Uh, yeah, you, if I were as comfortable as him, I could have just opened the wallet up and let the wind take it. <laughs> let it go. It'll, it'll find a home somewhere, yeah. a deserving home, that's for sure. Uh, but chased it down and uh, got old Abe back. Good for him. Mm -hmm. Good what, for him. Uh, what are some of the things as a club pro that have kept you up at night or woken well, you up out of it at um, sleep? You know, there was always just this intense fear of screwing up somebody's index before an important round. So we would have. I'm now, sure do all of you know what a, the difference between a handicap and a handicap index is? I can answer that question. No, not all of you know. In fact, most <laughs> of you do not. So go on. So, I did have in one event where um, it was a member guest, and there was an auction involved. Calcutta teams have already been auctioned off. Flights have been drawn, and not until after all that's done, the morning of the event, in fact. The guy notifies me, hey, my guess index is wrong. It was three-tenths of an index point. However, it was enough to change in one stroke. It would have changed his seating within the flight. I mean, at this time, at this point, you're, you're shit out of luck. I mean, Yeah, you're cooked. And that's where, um, those are the kind of things that keep you up. Luckily, it wasn't a big deal. People were understanding. It was on him because I was just given the information that he had told me. And also, as you know, being in the Chicagoland area, we have the CDGA, which is a little different. We do not have gin numbers, because why would we do anything in Illinois that would be like the rest of the world, right? Or the rest of the country, I should say. That's a good say. point. So it was one of those where he didn't have, he was actually a CDGA member out of state, but the, I couldn't compute, like with the gin number, it got kind of screwy. And, and then I've also had where somebody will have the same name, it'll be a junior or a senior, somebody will have the same name as his son. They'll have different handicaps. They play out of the same club. You're not sure who it is. Now, in that case, it's a little easier because you can at least ask the guy, like, hey, which one are you? Even if communication isn't the best, usually you can get to the bottom of it. But screwing up somebody's index for a consequential tournament, not, not good. Not good at all. Ha handicap uh, issues can ruin a day real fast. Oh, yeah. That's for sure. But the, to, to the point earlier, right, when your golf professional specifically asks, can you please provide either a handicap ID number, which is several digits long, right? It's usually a GIN number or a CDGA number, an R case, right? Um, 
There are a bunch of other golf associations that they have their own number. But that's an ID. It's like your license number. That's, that's unique to you. Then there's the handicap index, which usually has a decimal point on it. That is not a handicap. So don't ever provide your golf pro the handicap. That is useless information. The index absolutely is useless how you information. determine the handicap based right. on the course rating, the tees you're playing, all that good stuff. If you, the index is what we want. If you're bringing a guest or you are a guest at a club, make sure your number, that the information you provide is several digits long or has a decimal point in it. And then you, at least you're in the right, the right ballpark. And, and a club pro worth of salt can figure out how to get sure. to the bottom of it from there. But you're right, handicap issues affect everything in all these events, right? Flighting and all that stuff. And it's just an absolute nightmare. Mm -hmm. And the last thing you want is everyone to start turning and looking at you. Yep. Saying, what is the deal? <laughs> um, you know, the other one that uh, it doesn't cause me great panic, but it causes uh, a golfer, a member, tremendous panic. Um, there are a couple things. One, lost clubs. Stop the presses. Stop everything going on at the club. I left my seven iron somewhere a few holes ago. I need everyone to help me find it. It's like, whoa, wait. If it a doesn't show up in five minutes, somebody for sure stole it. Oh, totally. There's so many stole thieves it. at clubs across the country. All, everybody's a thief until you find it the next day. Because yep. No one turned in the club. Um, and then the other one is uh, umbrellas, lost umbrellas. Everyone thinks that clubs are littered with umbrella thieves, <laughs> right? That that's what they are. They just steal them all like crazy. And, and it couldn't be that you misplaced it when you ran in from the pouring rain, right? Of course not. Right? And then grabbed your sixth beer of the day. No. And why are umbrellas so damn expensive? I don't understand th th that either. But maybe that's why I everyone's freaking out about it. I've used an umbrella on a golf course, to be honest with you. Really? Yeah, yeah. I find them more annoying than anything else. They are. It's That's like true. rain hoods. Is there a more worthless piece of equipment than a rain hood on a golf bag? None. Um, I'm going to throw out the range finder there still. I th I th I'm going to go with this. the range finder and the mini driver are my top two most useless pieces of golf Give equipment out there. Finder. You, unless you are the only people that could benefit from a range finder. I get what you're saying. Are low single-digit handicappers. Tour professionals don't use them. They're not trying to get the distance to the flag or to the hole. They're looking for distances to certain slopes and everything that bends over. They're trying to land and shape the ball a certain way right, so that. that it approaches up the hole. Right. right. Because they have the ability to do just that. They are that so You're telling me a 25 handicap doesn't need to know that it's 122.6 to the flag? No. The, one, the 20 handicap needs to know that it's somewhere between 100 and 150 yards because that's about the distance they're going to hit. <laughs> Their 7-iron is somewhere between 100 and 150 yards. And no one outside of a tour player, maybe some low, low singles, have the ability to consistently play whatever club or iron in their bag the exact same distance or within a couple of yards every single time. That just does not happen. So the, the majority of golfers, the vast majority of golfers, should just look down at the sprinkler head that's somewhere within 10 yards of them, do some quick addition or subtraction, and pull a club that they think will get them to the middle of the green. And that is about it. No one should be flag hunting I agree. with a range finder. Again, going back to pace of play. Oh. PSA, play faster, people. Absolutely. It doesn't speed else. it up at all. And then the other one for me is, uh, is the, mini, the mini driver, right, that, that category. Um, hey, let me, let me just go with a club that doesn't go as far as a driver does off the tee um, and a club that's harder to get off the ground than the three wood, uh, the which is the hardest yet. club to hit. Then pull something else. I mean, my goodness. I, how, how's a mini driver going to? I want that club to be as big as possible. I don't, I, I don't want to jinx anything. I've never had the driver yips. I don't understand them. Chipping yips, I can talk about all night long. But for me, I want that head to be as big as possible. So the mini thing, I don't, I don't quite get either. I mean, I, I, know, I know Fleetwood uses one. But again, why are we modeling our games after one of the yeah. truly best players on planet. None of us should be comparing ourselves to any of no. the guys we see on television, um, even if it's just the, the brief clip at 11.30 at night. They're on TV. They're better than us, yep. right? That's the way it is. More talented, I should say. All right, well, anything else? Oh, you got something. All right. I do have one more that I just thought of. So back to the club pro days. There was, uh, you know, the high-maintenance members, the guys that would come in. You'd see them in the parking lot, and you're like, oh, 
what is he going to complain about or do or whatever. So It is funny, right? When you're sitting in the shop mm -hmm. and cars pull up, because you get to know the cars. Sure. You know the people by their cars because they're there all the time. And, and yeah, you have that moment where you're like, oh, so-and-so's pulling in. This is great, yeah. right? Awesome. I haven't seen them in a while or, or awesome. And then there are some that pull in and you're like, oh, no. Let me go run yeah. to make a copy somewhere, right? So this was one of those guys. And we'll call him Bill for the sake of the story. Bill did this... Uh, he got together this group of it was about 30 people from the club, and they'd go play another club out of state every year, and they'd do this, this Ryder Cup-style thing, which was all fun. It sounded like a lot of fun. It was just like a, a three-day deal that they'd do. They would always get matching shirts for it, mm. which is beyond ridiculous. Like, hey, I want to match my buddy. Like, you guys can be the red team, and I'll be the blue team. Hilarious. But anyway, I would always order it's shirts a shirt sale. For them. And that's all pretty the only easy thing, that's thing to do, right? Ordering shirts. Like, hey, I want this and I want this to have our club's logo and this to have theirs, or I wanted to say this on it and these are the sizes. Great, no big deal. These would get so involved. He did them three years in a row. Progressively, every year that he was, they would get so involved, he's like, I'd want, I want to say this on the chest and then on the right sleeve, I want to have this little patch here because this signifies this, like over the top. And then they would always be wrong, and he'd want to return them. They're already customized, can't do that. So anyway, we had this back and forth the last year that he did it, and he was ordering from a company who the rep was somebody that I had, um, that I was kind of friends with, at least to the point where we could kind of kid each other a little bit. So we're going back and forth on the shirts and this and that, and I had emailed this rep like four or five times, all because of how high maintenance he was. Like little changes, let's do this. He didn't like the proof that was sent over and over. So then on the last one, he was like, all right, thanks, Nate. And I was like, no problem, Bill, got it. And then the very next one, I forwarded his message to this rep, and I said, here's hopefully the last change, but no matter what, this will probably be wrong. <laughs> Except for I sent it to Bill because I had him on my brain, and I replied <laughs> to him instead of the rep. Nice. And as soon as I sent it, I'm like, there needs to be a button for me to erase this. What am I going to do? What yeah. am I going to do? Undo, undo, undo. What am I? So I was like freaking out for like 20 minutes. I'm like, this is, he was a board member, which made it even better. I'm like, this is how I get fired. Like I totally just made fun of him. Yep. Luckily he sent back like smart ass LOL. Cause I was enough of like a smart ass to people that I could kind of get away with it. And then I like was able to like make another joke and I'm like, no, sorry. And then I like said something a little more vulgar, and I was like, "That was being a smart ass." Winky face emoji. And I think, I, <laughs> oh, I saved it because I then worked for another two years. But I was freaking out. I've, we've all done that on text, right? You're like, "Man, Bill's an asshole," and then you send it to Bill, yep. like thinking, "Like, Whoops. oh, I thought I was talking to so and so." Yeah, the other Bill. I did that to a club member one time. So yeah. I was, hey, look, it, one of the best. <laughs> sometimes they just need to know. They just need to be I told. I think a little humility goes a long yep. way. I agree. Yeah. Yep. I don't know, without a doubt. It's just unvarnished opinion just forwarded <laughs> right back to him. Yeah, that's that's the way it the way it goes. The yeah, the the matching shirts thing, I agree. It's um uh, don't show up to your member guest wearing the same head to toe uniform as your partner. I that is just like those guys I would always send pictures to my wife. I'm like, look at who did it today. And like they would get some were crazy outfits, even the ones that was like an okay, like crisp looking outfit. It's like why do you want to match? Like that's the weirdest, I don't know. Any other day of the year, it's an accident. <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, but apparently, for the member guest thing, this is, yeah. Yeah. don't you guys talk about it? Actually, we did. We went shopping together. Yes, yeah. yes. Right. We've been planning this for months, in fact. <laughs> it, which, yeah, which is a little much. Just, you know, just play it off like, go have a good time. Have a good time at your member guest. Yeah, That's I don't wonderful. want to dog member guests. They were blast. No. I mean, I always thought it would be fun to play in them. They were not the most fun to work. They were long days, but like, but all the little stuff that goes along with them like that, and then like, it does help a little bit when like, you're, you know, you're checking on pace of play and you're looking a few hundred yards away right through the binoculars and like, oh, there are the two idiots in the pink shirt. All right. <laughs> I know help. that they're, they're two holes behind. Okay. So that, that's good. Um, all right, cool. Well, we'll be back uh, next week with another edition of Four Balls. Um, yeah. Thanks for listening. Happy Halloween.